What's up, guys? With Faraz Zahabi, we just finished listening to that clip of Neil. He's an astrophysicist. To distinguish we from they, he loosely qu quotes a phrase out of the Bible by saying, Our God is the God who named the stars. Now, this is before I was on his Rolodex, okay? Uh, because I could have helped him out there. The fact is, of all the stars that have names, two-thirds of them have Arabic names. So this was not, I don't think, his intent with that message. Okay? <laughs> While the constellations are Greek and Roman, the names are Arabic, all right? And the list just goes on and on and on. And on. and so where does this come from? How does how do how do you get us? How does this happen? How do you get stars named with Arabic names? How does this happen? And it happens because it happens because there was this particularly fertile, fertile period that um, Professor Weinberg duly discussed. Um, and around that period, that 300-year period, the intellectual center of the world was Baghdad. Baghdad. It was completely open to all visitors, all travelers, Jews, Christians, uh, doubters, which today we might call atheists. They were all there exchanging ideas, all of them, all of them. And it was that period where you had the advances in like engineering and, and biology and medicine and, and, and mathematics, all right? Our numerals are called what? Arabic numerals. They ever stop and think about that? You know, who's, who, as in, in America, do we pause, take pause at this? Why are they called Arabic numerals? Okay, they fully exploit the, the discovery of the zero, create a whole field called algebra, itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. All this is going on, and it's all traceable, not to some long thousand-year tradition in, the, in Islam. It's traceable to this 300-year period. This 300-year period. And then, so they had naming rights. The most expensive, beautifully uh, carved astrolabes come out of this period. There's a great collection of these at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, if you ever want to check them out. So navigation, celestial navigation, all of this is traceable to this period. That's right. He got how many PhDs? Too many to count, man. <laughs> Too many to count. He made some really profound statements of truth, but then he, he got out of his lane. He might have made a few errors. Something happened. And what happened, as was previously described, I was told, and I get, forgive me for repeating from what you might have heard, 12th century kicks in, and then you get the influence of this scholar, Al-Ghazali, all right? And so, so out of his work, you get the philosophy that mathematics is the work of the devil. And nothing good can come of that philosophy. That combined with other sort of codification, philosophical codifications of what Islam would, was and would become, the entire intellectual foundation of that enterprise collapsed, and it has not recovered since. Over that period, all these books were translated into Arabic on a scale not seen since then. And so, so, so why, why, why am I even going here? Because I'm trying to explain to you that the, you fast forward, the, the dangers here is that what, you fast forward to 21st century America and ask, what influences do we, are we feeling now? Because that, per, that naming period in Islam stopped and, and it never recovered. Because the, 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 the way of thinking about the natural world, revelation replaced investigation. Okay? Had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. It's fortunate we got, you got, you're an expert in this area also of philosophy and whatnot. So let's correct those and help him, well, uh, he, uh, we maybe get this message to him so maybe he can, uh, next time he gives his presentation, he can make some adjustments. Well, all, all, all due respect to Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, he said some things that are very true. One, he said that, okay, the golden age of Islam was the golden age of science, 
We've never had any uh, advancements like we've had in that period. Why? Well, in the Quran, it tells you, look, you want to know about God? Go look at the signs of God in nature. It tells you that. Go out there and look inside and look outside and study and go and find all the answers that God, all the mysteries that God has waiting for you. So the Muslims were very uh, pro-science. They were very pro-knowledge, very pro-logic. In the, in the Quran, it says hundreds of times, reason. Reason is superior to uh, blind faith, so to speak. So we had a, a, a boom of intellectualism. An uh, incredible broom, boom. Now, all of science has a bedrock in Arabic. Not all of it. A lot of science has a bedrock in uh, Arabic philosophy. Now, how do we know this? Well, th the scientific method itself was designed by Hassan ibn Haytham. People don't know this. People attribute it to uh, Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon was 300 years later. Um, uh, Hassan ibn Haytham was a Muslim scholar who developed the the scientific method as we have it today. Now, of course, Aristotle uh, contributed very much, but it wasn't the scientific method we have today. It, that was the difference between deduction and induction. In it teaching us uh, the difference between induction and induction. But Neil deGrasse Tyson later goes on to say, that, look, the Arabs, the Muslims, they were at this pinnacle of science. They reached the top of the top. They made the most advances. Math, biology, uh, medicine, uh, navigation, all these these incredible advancements. The first university in history is the, I, 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 in the Islamic world. Anybody who was an intellectual had to travel to the Islamic world, the University of Baghdad, the House of Knowledge, to study. What happened? Well, <clears throat> one thing he doesn't get correct exactly is that it's the Mongols that came and chopped down the Islamic, uh, the Islamic world. The Mongols, Hulagu Khan, not Genghis Khan, not Genghis Khan, Hulagu, his, his grandson, came and uh, burnt the libraries of the Muslims. So all these incredible books that we never had passed down to us, all this incredible knowledge, lost. And for 80 years, there was a massive onslaught on Muslim people. The descriptions of the onslaught by the Mongols onto the Muslims is horrendous. Okay, it's, it's as bad as you can imagine. But within that 80 years, the Mongols also then converted to Islam. So instead of spreading from town to town, building mountains of skulls, they were spreading, now going town to town, sp opening up mosques. The Muslims went away from Islam, and then they conquered them, and then Islam no, no, conquered the, the, the Mongols. The, Mongo the Mongols conquered is the Islamic Golden Age. They cut down the Islamic Golden Age. And uh, the Muslims at that time have gone away from Islam. Not no, necessarily. They were very Muslim. They were mm -hmm. very, very Muslim. They were just, they were still very religious, just very scientific, mathematically oriented, logically oriented, uh, oriented towards philosophy. They wrote countless great books. Those books were burned by the Mongols. And then Neil deGrasse Tyson in the video is saying, okay, well, how come they never rose back up? How come the Mongols never rose, uh, excuse me, how come the Muslims never rose back up to greatness? He, well, he blamed that on one particular individual. He said, oh, it's because of Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali said, I'm abbreviating, math is from the devil. So this is a false statement. False statement, totally okay. false. So like that's one, that's one, one, number one correction that is, right there. That is the central theme of his, of his speech, right? He's saying, look, the Muslim world has been cut at the kneecaps, as he says, but because of Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali reformed Islam and told the Muslims, math is from the devil, don't do math, don't think, don't be logical. How can, he be, how can he be wrong? He's got 12, 12 PhDs. Yeah, believe me, he's wrong. Because I'll tell you why he's wrong. Because he's never read the works of Imam Ghazali. And I say this with all due respect, because if you read even the... the if you read the works of Imam Ghazali superficially, you would know that he was a lover of logic, a lover of wisdom, a, lo a lover of knowledge and science. In fact, in his confessions, he says that, because he has such a trust in logic, he says, nobody could ever convince me that seven is less than three or that three is greater than seven because that would be illogical. The definition of three entails that it's less than seven. He says, suppose a man were to walk up to me a, with a staff and turn the staff into snake, into a snake. And that was his proof that three is greater than seven. He says, I still wouldn't believe him. I'd be astonished that he could turn a staff into a snake. Mm -hmm. But I still wouldn't believe the logical inconsistency that three is greater than seven or that seven is less than three. That's how much he had a, of a regard for mathematics. Because... Neil deGrasse Tyson was trying to, s it seemed like he was trying to say, point to, that Imam Ghazali believed rather in superstition than mathematics. He thought the mathematics is from the devil and these superstitions are from God. Where it's the complete opposite. Imam Ghazali was 
incredibly adamant about this, that logic and reason and science come first. And every type of uh, illusion you might have is ungodly or un, un, untrue. That if somebody were to turn a staff into a snake, it, if they use that as proof against logic, we would have to reject them. So superstition takes a back seat to logic and science. So I, all due respect to Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's tried to answer a very complex question. Scholars today, if you ask them, why hasn't the Islamic world risen again? The answer is very complicated and nobody can point to one thing. That's the, the general consensus. Nobody can point to one reason why. But in my opinion, look, I'm here to tell you, I think the Muslim world now has to return back to a level, to a place where we put intellectualism and science and the deen and we find a way to unify them wholeheartedly. And this is what Imam Ghazali did and what all the Muslims did at that time. And that's why they were so successful. We thank him for the truths that he was expounding on about the contributions by all the Muslims at that time, the scholars. But you made a great analysis of something that he said that you corrected. God willing, I can get to him next time he has that PowerPoint presentation. Inshallah. He can uh, thank uh, Zahabi for us <laughs> from TriStar Gym. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Awesome, brother. Jazakallah. Thank you. Salam alaikum. It's like, when did you think that you had no purpose? Are you worthless? The value comes from purpose. Because at the end of the day, you get something, you always want more. You get some weed, you want more. You get some drugs, you want harder drugs. You get a girl, you want a nicer girl. You get a car, you want a nicer car. You get a house, you want a nicer house. We've got so many pressures by enslaving yourself, worshiping God, loving God. But submission to the one who created you. And by worshiping God and seeking his pleasure, you get pleased and you enter paradise. God bless you.